One characteristic of the digital big data footprint is that it's notoriously unstructured and completely incomplete. That's because people do not purposefully make sure that you get all your data. They just do things uh, online. And as a result, you have a very incomplete picture. But on the other hand, there's also such a multifaceted variety of digital footprints that you can use then in order to complement these and, and fill up these missing holes. And they can be of different nature. There can be images, text, uh, video, and, and, and audio snippets. So uh, for example, let's take one concrete example. Traditionally, if you want to get a credit, a mortgage, you had a credit score. And traditionally, credit ratings, they had just a handful, a dozen of variables. For example, if you historically always paid your credit debts on time and the length of your credit history. So if you have a long record or not, it's just a handful of variables, maybe a dozen. Now, recently, some companies came up, for example, this company says finance, and they used thousands of variables, including very alternative variables, for example, your cell phone bills and how you pay them. So even if you never had a credit history, if you had a cell phone, they used this to estimate your credit worthiness, your social contract contacts on social media sites, who you are friends with and how they behave, and even things like how you uh, how you served on the Zest Finance website, how you read it, what kind of click stream you had. And that gave a lot of information away about how worthy you are of getting a credit. With a result, after analyzing these thousands of variables, uh, they were able to predict default with a 40% better prediction than traditional credit score rating. That means also if you can predict 40% of the defaults of the uh, not payback rate, if not payback events better, you can also offer loans for 40% cheaper than traditional credit rating. And that's a big advantage for everybody involved. They just know are you more credit worthy or not. One of the interesting things, according to the founder of this of this company, is that uh, that there are no peoples for whom all of the fields in the database are filled. There's always a large amount of missing data for each one of the rows in your database. But data fusion, with data fusion, they were able to complement and to make up to fill up these holes. And some of the fundamental technologies that made the big data paradigm possible, for example, MapReduce and Hadoop, are also based on this logic, based on this logic of decentralizing, analyzing many different databases and then bringing them together. So what MapReduce and Hadoop do best is they take a big database, but it's way too big to analyze it centrally in one giant server. So they split them up, process them in parallel, and then bring the results together again. And this is one of the fundamental logics of how the big data paradigm works, this looking for many different sources and bringing them together to get one coherent outlook. It's often referred to as data fusion. Insights like creditworthiness are of course extremely valuable also economically. And there are several companies who have started to trade big data as a commodity. So they really sell these kind of insights. Here, for example, a mobile phone operator, Telefonica, got together with a consumer uh, agency, research agency. And what they do is they start to sell mobility data. So mobile phone operators, they know where everybody is. because They, they track their mobile phones and then they sold these anonymized data uh, to business people. So if you're an entrepreneur and you want to set up a new store in town, you can go there and you can study these patterns. You can see which kind of people with which kind of gender and what kind of income walk around in which time of the day where and you can optimize the location of your specific store. Might it be of men clothes or women clothes or, or, or whatever. There's a bunch of new companies that uh, you never heard of and you don't know, but they know everything about you that specialize on well, harvesting the big data footprint and developing insights. For example, about con consumer financial vulnerabilities. And there are some then categories they put us in, they classify us in, and they sell that to other companies who are interested in making business with different segments of society. So just for the sake of you get a little bit more insight, I'm going to show you some of these categories they put us in. For example, one category is, is social influencer. So that's a very important category. So the people who are social influencer, you want to focus on them and you want to market specific products to them because you know then these products 
get spread by these social influences. Another category is rural and barely making it. People who live on the countryside with very little income. Ethnic second city strugglers is another one. Retiring on empty, singles. Very interesting category. Tough start, young single parents. Credit crunched city families. Transitory lifestyle, military personnel. Another category is elderly opportunity seekers. Elderly looking for ways to make money. You can imagine the kind of companies are interested in, in this kind of segment of society. And my all time favorite is oldies but goodies. Gullible want to believe that their luck can change. So these are the kind of people you want to sell lottery tickets to. So it's very interesting, actually qu quite rough and very transparent how we are getting classified and companies now do tailor-made strategies in order to embrace this kind of segment or this kind of segment with different kind of versions of different products that they have and services. One important example of the complementary nature of different data sources is network analysis, in our case, social network analysis. So in social network analysis, you always have two different kinds of databases. You have the traditional database that you use when you do traditional statistics, basically describing the attributes of people. So you have here Jorge, Maria, Juan, and Magda, and you know that Jorge is male, Maria is female, Juan is male, Magda is female. You know that Jorge and Maria are urban, that's why they're triangles. Juan and Magda uh, live in a rural area, that's why they are circles and so forth and you describe these characteristics, these attributes. And then you can create statistics about the average income, about the percentages of male and female, rural and urban areas and so forth. So this is traditional statistics. Now in network analysis you have a second database. You need a second database and that basically shows you about who is connected to whom because that's not what society looks like. Society is not an independent collection of some randomly thrown in people where nobody has to do nothing with somebody else. In reality society rather looks something like this. Some people are connected to others but not to all of the others, just to some of the others. So then you create these network databases. For example, you can see here that Jorge is connected to Maria. He's not connected to Juan, but he is connected to Magda. Maria is connected to Jorge, to herself. She is not connected to Juan, but Maria is connected to Magda. And then you fill up the second database. It's a matrix, adjacency matrix, that's the technical term. And you basically record who is connected to whom. And then you do analysis on this database as well. And in social network analysis, you analyze both databases together. And they together give you a very interesting, very complete picture of how society actually works. For example, in political blogs, you can see that people with certain attributes for example, their political conviction, if they are one or the other, other parties, has to do also with whom they hang out with. So who you are affects of who you hang out with. And the other way around, we also find contagion. So who you hang out with affects who you are. It's kind of like your mother always told you, you know, be careful who you hang out with because first of all, people will start talking and second of all, also it will affect of who you will become. So be careful who you hang out with. No, no, don't hang with the bad crowd, right? So, and your mom was completely right. We find if we study both of them together that who you hang out with affects who you will become. It's a very strong predictor and who you are also affects of who you hang out with. So that's an example of data fusion that was made available available through the digital footprint because now suddenly we don't only know who you are, we also know who you hang out with because you tell us through social networks and the like.